Hello, it's me, Brian, again, Finlog's imaginary twin brother, here for a second time to try to persuade you to believe that God is terrific, and that even though he already knows whether you are going to heaven or hell, he still wants you to accept him and his son Jesus into your heart, so you can go and sing hymns of praise with a choir of heavenly angels, forever. Or you'll go to the other place. The thing is that you don't know which way you're going, but God does. Everything has a divine purpose, and one of God's purposes must be to savour your confusion. This kind of reminds me of how he used to enjoy the smell of all those sacrificial burnt offerings. But even though he's unchanging and eternal, he no longer requires us to sacrifice animals like he used to. He came up with an ingenious way around that. Last time I told you about how he magically impregnated a young virgin girl called Mary, and how she gave birth to Jesus of Nazareth. Well, this Jesus was blessed with a supersized dose of the Holy Spirit, and he became the third part of the Holy Trilogy. And in order to forgive us for the sinful nature he created us with, God arranged it so that Jesus would be tortured and killed by wicked people. And this not only absolves us from everything we've done wrong, provided we believe the story, of course, but it also satisfied Yahweh himself to the point that he no longer even wanted us to carry out the blood sacrifices. Genius! Who other than the one true supergod could have come up with a foolproof plan like that? He even arranged it so that Jesus' death was only temporary. He magically came back to life three days after, and after spending some time with his disciples, as if by magic, he flew up to heaven. Last time I spoke a little about how the Big Bang and the arguments put forward by cosmologists and astrophysicists could not possibly be true, because they contradict the superior account of creation which we find in the Bible. And, like I said, we're just puny, insignificant creatures who think we've got it all figured out. But the point that the heathen sinners, and even some of the so-called moderate Christians fail to realise, is that God is the ultimate authority. He's the super boss. If he chooses to dictate or inspire a bunch of Middle Eastern Bronze Age men to record his stories, then we must accept that that is the best method of communicating the message to us. When we read the Bible and marvel at its brilliance, we discover that our awesomely amazing creator doesn't want us to have a good understanding of how the world works. At least, not one based on evidence found outside the Bible. God would rather that we believe the stories. We must put our scepticism to one side and accept his holy authority. As far as God is concerned, belief and faith far outweigh knowledge and understanding. And it is these attributes which determine whether our souls go to heaven or hell after we die. The Bible clearly tells us that heaven is a really, really, really nice place, and that hell is unspeakably awful. Who would choose to go there for an eternity of torment? Who would choose to spend more time than it's possible to imagine being burnt to a crisp, beaten to a pulp, maimed and tortured? So, the simple and obvious solution is to convince ourselves that God is the ultimate manifestation of goodness, morality, and all the other good stuff, and to accept the sacrifice which Jesus made on our behalf, effectively absolving us of the guilt we inherited from Adam and Eve, plus all of the other bad things we've done in our sinful lives. So, by believing and accepting all this, we can appease God, and pretty much guarantee our ticket to heaven. As a young Earth creationist, I need to believe that the Earth and the wider cosmos are no older than about 6,000 years old. Unfortunately, God has made this a little tricky for us, because he's planted quite a lot of evidence which makes it seem as if it's all much, much older. He really knows how to test our faith in him. But, like I said before, we must acknowledge the superior authority of him and his book, and pay attention to that comfortable, warm and fuzzy feeling in our hearts, which happens to be the Holy Spirit, which is there to guide us all to the ultimate truth the biblical truth. Because the Bible 
cannot contain any errors. The theory of evolution by natural selection cannot be right, at least not on the sort of timescale which the planted evidence suggests. We do find fossils in the geological strata which make it look like the ancestors of modern plants and animals were different and more simple the further back in time we go, but we can dismiss all of that. We must dismiss it as an illusion. The same goes for dendrochronology. God is a very clever deity here too, because he has made it seem like there is an unbroken record of living and dead trees whose annual growth rings tell us what the weather was like every year for about 40,000 years. That's nearly eight times the age of the universe, according to the Bible. Our awesomely omnipotent creator must have put all this evidence in place, all over the planet, shortly before he created the Garden of Eden. So it's not like he planted a new forest with seeds. He must have magically poofed mature forests and habitat into existence which included a mixture of young, old, and even dead vegetation. If that's not amazing to think about, I don't know what is. There are many other things which make it seem like the Earth and the universe are orders of magnitude older, but, like I said before, we can and must dismiss all of this evidence. All of the ice core samples, the fossils, the peat bogs, plate tectonics, the geological record, and even the DNA, which corroborates what Charles Darwin came up with and makes it seem like all life forms today are distant cousins, that we all share common ancestors, all the way back through time on what evolutionary theorists call the tree of life. As if they know what they're talking about. It's all part of God's divine plan to weed out those who allow doubt into their lives, condemning them to eternal suffering and surrounding himself with true believers who will continuously tell him how great he is, because that's what he wants and that's what he likes, and rightly so. Hopefully by this point I will have persuaded more of you to turn your back on Satan, to abandon your evil and treacherous ways, and join me in worship as we eagerly await the end of the world.